right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good morning to our very first Inland Empire Data Summit. We're so happy to have you all here for this first event that we're doing. So thank you all for coming. We have a very packed program for you all. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started with some announcements so we can get right in to all the information that we're going to be giving you today. So um, Eric, if you want to go to the next slide for our announcements. So just some quick um, Zoom etiquette and housekeeping items. Go ahead and feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat, say your name, your organization, um, maybe what part of the Inland Empire you're all from. Um, please feel free to reach out to folks in the chat and say hello. Um, and please be polite and respectful to our speakers. Keep yourselves on mute so that we can hear them when they are speaking. And you can feel free to keep your camera off, but please uh, use the emoji Zoom reactions to give some praise to our speakers um, so that they don't feel like they're talking to an empty room. And please be present. Our speakers have such a wealth of knowledge and information that they're going to share with you all today. So we don't want you to miss anything because it's going to be very, very important and informational to hear. So with that, those are the quick announcements. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Karthik, who's going to lead us in um, welcome this morning. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And hopefully everyone's able to hear you. <clears throat> OK. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, being here. This is so exciting. Um, you know, we see, you know, I think already close to 100 people that are logging in now. Over 200 people have signed up and this is being recorded. So we will uh, share it with folks. Um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Erica, who I was running the slide. So I'm Karthik Ramakrishnan. I'm the uh, director for the Center for Social Innovation and part of um, IE Rise. And IE Rise is something we can talk about more later at the end. Uh, it's an effort. Uh, that has evolved over time, and we're bringing in some new energy into that effort. Uh, IE RISE stands for the Inland Empire Roadmap for Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equity for Community Well-Being. And that's going to be the fo that's the focus, uh, by the way, of many of the things we do at the Center for Social Innovation is this focus on community well-being. And I, and, and, and I think that's something that unites us all here today. Of course, many of us are data geeks, and some of us may be just content to be pure data geeks, but I think most of us are here because we see the power of bringing data, bringing community partnerships with an eye toward strategic action, um, and just really thrilled to be with you all today. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, data hub and the data summit uh, is part of the work that CSI has volunteered and taken on as a special project of IE RISE. We are also in the early stages of helping to craft a uh, vision and investment roadmap for 2030 in our region that is grounded in evidence. So in the process of developing an evidentiary base for it, including briefing books, we are uh, already, we know that many of the reports that are part of the research portal uh, that we have assembled uh, will be critical to that. Uh, and we would love your engagement uh, as we build out that work over the summer. Uh, and then starting in the fall and through next year, um, we're gonna be uh, engaging uh, collaboratively with a variety of stakeholders in government, philanthropy, and most importantly, community um, to go through a set of design exercises to help craft a vision that is aspirational uh, and a set of strategies and tactics, including policy actions and investment actions from the public sector as well as the private sector that will make those aspirations a reality. Um, if you're interested in those two aspects, the IDATA Hub and Resource Portal, as well as the 2030 Vision and Investment Roadmap, please contact Sarah Wright. More generally about IE RISE, which has a, a bigger and kind of broader agenda, of bringing various collective efforts uh, in the region together. So there's stronger relationship building and coordination across a range of uh, coalitions and activities. Please contact Damien O'Farrell uh, from Parkview Legacy. So I'm gonna give a little bit of motivation in terms of why are we here today uh, and where, are, where we see, we as the Center for Social Innovation, but also so many others uh, that you saw on the co-sponsorship list where we see the work of the research portal, 
these data demonstrations, and then ultimately the data hub that we're also building, where that fits in into a larger strategy for uh, community voice, uh, advancing key goals like sustainability and equity, and then ultimately just regional strength and regional impact. Next slide, please. And to do that, I'll take you through a little bit of a journey. Some of you may know this. In addition to the work that I and our center does in our region, um, I've been doing national work uh, involving Asian American and Pacific Islander communities since 2014. Well, it goes even prior to that, where I was a co-PI on the National Asian American Survey in 2008. But in 2014, soon after we launched the API data, we realized that if we want data to have impact, there is no way that any one research entity does it alone. It has to be done collaboratively. And what we did is we had a research portal and research showcase. We built a research portal in 2014 in API data, and you can still find it on our site under Deeper Dives. And we had a research showcase where we had community organizations as well as other research partners showcasing the kind of research that they've done in the prior year. Very similar to what you'll find today. So this is back in 2014. Next slide. Now we built on that in 20, oh, the one, thank you. We built on that in 2015 with um, going from that showcase to then getting federal agencies, right? At a high level, getting folks from the Census Bureau, the Council of Economic Advisors, the National Center for Health Statistics, et cetera. So we had a panel on federal agencies and what they are doing, right, to advance, you know, what we were now called data equity work, but it's you know, the work from data to action. We also had a subsequent panel that had representatives from the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, MSNBC, and PBS NewsHour. So you already see within a year how quickly people saw the value of doing this. Next slide. The year after that, API data worked with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and we did a data challenge. We challenged researchers from high school and college to take various data sets and to produce their own um, you know, blog posts and infographics related to that data. And we brought heavy hitters from the federal government to be there as judges and also to talk about the importance of making data more easily accessible. Next slide. And then finally, just a month ago, um, we had the privilege uh, of being at the White House, building on the foundations of the Equitable Data Working Group. So in addition to panelists from key federal agencies uh, that are in charge of improving data systems to advance equity, um, we also had key players such as the Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as the Office of Management and Budget, who are key to the data equity work moving forward. On, in addition to this government agency panel, we had a community organization panel, and we have several calls to action that are underway right now to help the federal government and various agencies in their data equity journey. So I just want to put that all out there as an inspiration uh, to say that what we're starting today seems pretty small, although I'm so impressed, Sarah and team, with the amazing set of presenters that we have today. Um, but I, I truly believe that, especially seeing so many uh, county government agency officials signed up uh, to be here, uh, I am hopeful that in our two counties that we can leverage the power of data systems of all stripes, as well as people in various agencies um, to build a collective effort that spans academic institutions, government institutions, philanthropy, and community organizations to really shift not only the narrative and perception, but key investment dynamics in our region, uh, moving from data and narrative to action. So that's the high level overview. I'll just say a little bit about the research portal that we have built that's still in draft form for today, if you can go to the next slide. So uh, this is a very simple research portal that we've built up. Uh, we've asked our team members to scour to find uh, academic as well as um, organization and government agency studies that touch upon uh, either the counties or communities contained within the two county region. Uh, and if you go to ierise.org slash research dash portal, you'll see this draft version today. If you can go to the next slide. And we have some placeholder images right now. Um, oh, maybe that slide is missing. In the, the, so you, if you go there, you will see some, some placeholder images 
uh, but you will see posts that have the abstracts uh, and credits the authors of these uh, various studies, and you can uh, download those reports. Uh, we have close to 40 reports that are current, meaning that they've been produced over the last three years and that touch upon this uh, two county region. Um, I'll leave it at that and I'll turn it back over to Sarah who will introduce uh, the rest of the agenda and the speakers that we have. But just again, want to re reiterate, so grateful to have you all here. Uh, we might not all get to go to the White House in four years, but pretty confident with the amazing talent and energy and commitments that we have in the room today that we're gonna achieve great things uh, over the next couple of years uh, in terms of building uh, a, a data user community, a data infrastructure, and then ultimately uh, to be able to drive change uh, in our region uh, that uh, advances some of our core values and key priorities in meaningful ways. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Karthik. So as Karthik mentioned, we're going to go ahead and jump into the research showcase portion of our program today. But first, to do that, we're going to hear from Beth Tamayosi, the research director here at CSI, who's going to give us a brief overview of some of our reports and research that we've done here. So Beth? Great. Hi. Thanks, Sarah. So hi, everyone. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Beth Tomiosne, and I'm the research director here at the center. And I just wanted to reiterate that we're super excited about this data summit because at the center, we're you know very passionate about data and all the ways it can be used to spur innovation and action both in the region and you know extending to understand how policy can extend outwards from that as well. So next slide. Our general approach to all of the th work we do is what um, Karthik alluded to earlier just now was this thing called DNA and that's data narrative in action. And what that really is talking about is utilizing data to create narratives and from that to spur that into action. And a lot of what we do is rooted in this idea that we want to move from a problem problem-based to an asset-based approach. So we want to be able to uplift a lot of what's going on in the region and say like, hey, instead of just, you know, the data says, hey, these are issues, we wanna be able to say, look, there's some, you know, this is the background to why we're doing things. And then this is when we start digging in, this is what a lot of the community groups are doing to uplift and help move the needle forward. And in order to do that, what we do is we usually use what we call a mixed methods approach, which is basically complementing qualitative data with original qualitative data. And so so part of that is taking data sets that we have you know, available and then doing interviews, focus groups, um, surveys, and basically trying to dig up what's going on in the community and in, with the idea that we want to be able to incorporate community profiles to shed a spotlight on what's being done in the community, what's being really done on the ground. And so the key pillars of all, you know, everything, the work we do here at the center is, you know, it's rooted in social science, strategic policy awareness, innovation mindsets and deep community partnerships. And again, this goes back to this DNA framework that really informs everything we do here. Next slide, please. So as Karthik mentioned, we have a set of reports that we have done on the Inland Empire. One is the State of series, and that basically is a deep dive into several different topics that focus specifically on the Inland Empire. And two of the ones that we have here right now too, as examples, is the State of Education Equity and State of Innovation, which you'll hear about later on in the session. But we also have other IE-specific reports that talk into several, delve into several different topics. One of them is looking at good jobs in the region. And we really wanted to dig into this because we wanted to understand the opportunities for economic recovery and resilience. And then another one is thinking about the, how we can think about inclusive economic development in developing regions like the Salton Sea region, which spans Imperial and Riverside counties in our area. Next, please. So as part of this, we have created several frameworks to help guide the work we do. And one of them is this ready to rise framework for projects and programs. And I wanted to um, highlight that it's for both projects and programs. So it's not just thinking about the research you do, but also the programmatic stuff that we roll out. And so one of the, one of the components of this is the idea of readiness, that the projects have to be ready, but also looking at everything we do within the lenses of equity, sustainability, inclusion, and resilience, because going back to the key pillars of what we do, we want to make things more equitable, 
We want to make things more sustainable. We want to make things more inclusive. And we also really want to make sure that what we're doing is helping increase resilience in the area. And that brings us to the second framework, which is thinking about this idea of continuum of civic engagement. So the idea behind this framework is saying that, well, we can do an intervention at one point, but we want to make sure that we continue the circle. So in this particular example, we're looking at census outreach. But if you get to the point where people vote, we want to continue to push folks to say like, okay, well, what happens beyond voting? And one of the options for that is potentially, you know, showing folks that they can run for office, that they can help push the policy needle in different ways than just voting, that they can help be a more active participant in the policy realm. Next slide, please. Also within this idea of the RISE framework, we have what we're proposing is a standard measure of equity and inequity. And again, this goes back into this idea of we want to be able to use data to be able to spur narrative and action. And this particular idea is using the Hoover index to create these what we're calling standard measures. So it becomes easier for policymakers and others to be able to compare across regions on different types of variables. And the idea in this particular example is looking at, okay, well, we have this very complicated table, but we can condense it all into this very condensed snapshot. And then folks ideally can quickly you see like, okay, well, where are the bars lining up? How does my region compare to other regions? And we can do this for various different variables. This particular one is looking at home ownership, but then you can do it for basically a bunch of different things. And this is basically, you know, examples of our particular approach to looking at data and figuring out how we can use it to change the narrative of our region to spur people into action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, now we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Stacy Cumberbatch from Blended Impact, who's going to be highlighting another one of our reports. Stacy, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stacy Cumberbatch. I'm with Blended uh, Impact, and we had the chance to work with the Center for Social Innovation last year and launch the State of Innovation in the Inland Empire report. Um, the CSI team spent close to a year researching uh, San Bernardino and Riverside counties' um, innovation. Uh, ecosystem frameworks, uh, both nationally and here, um, doing interviews as well as looking at the talent pipeline and how we can move that talent pipeline into good paying jobs that the region desires. Um, I was consulted specifically on the funding portion of things because once we, we identify the jobs that we want to, um, to have here, we need to understand who's currently hiring for those jobs and are they growing in the region and who's gonna be growing in the future. So we did a comprehensive analysis of all of the private companies in the region, their funding rounds, the industries that are expanding, um, the clusters, where are they based, for example, alongside um, uh, the emerging industries that are coming into the region and being supported by our universities and other support organizations. Uh, we released that report last year and you can see a, um, a copy of that on CSI site. I will put that in the chat for you right now. And this year uh, for 2021, we did a one year update. Now the first report we did covered all time through 2020. Um, this year's report will cover through 2021 and it will be more of a uh, uh, following the, the framework of the data narrative action in that it will be an infographic report. So this is not meant to be a full on report. It's meant to be research based um, data that you can then take and use and, and be actionable with. Um, our key takeaways from this year, for example, is there's a lot of activity that's happening in the Inland Empire that needs to be amplified. Our private companies are raising at tremendous rounds. They raised over $100 million last year, which is quite significant for the region. Um, it's a 12% year over year increase, for example. Um, and we're seeing that we have a lot of great eyes on us. Um, in last year's report, we saw that Mark Cuban had been investing in the region. In this year's report, we saw that Alexis Ohanian's fund has been investing in the region. So to even see that we have those type of um, visibility starting to grow is excellent. And the reason that we focus on funding rounds, for example, example, is uh, the National Venture Capital Association has uh, shown through their data that companies that raise capital can hire at an eight times faster rate 
than other companies. So the companies that are raising money are the companies that are going to be the ones that are, are growing in the region and obviously bringing the jobs that we want to see. Um, we saw that companies that are being supported by our ecosystem partners um, in our new emerging uh, industries, such as ag tech, uh, biotech, clean tech, and cybersecurity, they're also uh, starting to show even more and more on those leaderboards. Um, so that's great to see that all of the, the resources that we're putting behind our companies at an ecosystem level is also starting to grow and be as competitive as, as companies that are within the region elsewhere. Um, we're also seeing that we have quite a bit of um, uh, additional ecosystem infrastructure being built up across the region. So for example, last year, uh, there was uh, new entrepreneurship centers that was opened uh, via AMPAC in Ontario, via the Randall Lewis Center at the University of Laverne, uh, Loma Linda University and their new hospital, uh, the IHUB in Palm Desert. So when we start looking at a regional basis, we can see that we're, uh, we're covering quite a bit of geography in trying to reach diverse entrepreneurs and diverse geographies as well. Um, the last piece I want to highlight is that we are seeing uh, the Inland Empire leading in the amount of innovation related job posting in the region, and they're outpacing um, the state of California and even LA at the moment. So um, that research was provided by the center, and we will be sharing that out on the new uh, IE Squared website that uh, the center is hosting to specifically focus on all of these innovation uh, ecosystem activities, um, in addition to a quarterly uh, showcase highlight that the center does. So I just dropped those links in the uh, chat for you. Uh, the center will be following up with an email that uh, contains all of this. So you will get that infographic report. And we ask that when you do, you please share it out. Uh, also, we want to make sure that this narrative starts to reach not only internally, but externally to beyond the Inland Empire. So folks really know what's happening and what's coming uh, in the region. So I'll stop there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you for dropping the links in the chat. Please check that out. We'll go ahead and move next to Michael Stoll um, from CSUSB Center for Entrepreneurship. Michael? Hey, good morning, everybody. Mike Stoll. I have the pleasure of serving as the director of the Inland Empire Center for Entrepreneurship, as well as the School of Entrepreneurship. Context, we have one of the largest university-based centers for entrepreneurship in the United States and the first and only School of Entrepreneurship in the state of California. Um, as part of our Jack H. Brown College of Business and Public Administration. So uh, my first slide, if you want to advance to that, is uh, I'm just going to give you the context. What I'm going to tell you about today is the State of Entrepreneurship Report. <clears throat> this is an annual report that we, we launched in 2021. So ongoing, you know, future years, every year we're going to have a new version of the report with new bells and whistles. And I want to kind of give you a, a context of why we did it and then a couple of brief insights don't have a lot of time, obviously, to go dive deep, but if you want to geek out with me on data, I'm happy to have a side conversation or even a separate meeting. But um, why we did it, you know, obviously, you know, our center um, worked with almost 25,000 business owners last year through all of our community-based programs. And so, selfishly, we want to be better tuned into what's going on in the community, what their needs are. But really, as a region, if we're going to develop, um, we're going to have to pay attention to entrepreneurship. It's a key economic driver. Um, job creation, innovation. Um, and so we need to have good data to make strategic decisions about how we support entrepreneurship. Um, and so the report, if you go to the next slide, uh, consists of four um, elements. We have four key indicators of entrepreneurship, which I'm going to describe. We did a comprehensive survey of, of local entrepreneurs. We did an ecosystem assessment, and we talked to key players in the region about their perspectives on entrepreneurship. The four key indicators on your screen, and I'll just briefly touch on these. The Kauffman Foundation does these every year nationally and at the state level, but nobody has ever done them at the regional or local level. And so we developed these indicators, or took these indicators and dove down deep with the data sets we've acquired and um, took a look at the rate of new entrepreneurs. That's startup creation, what's happening? And how do we compare with the state and national? Well. Basically, we, you know, for us in the Inland Empire region, San Diego, Riverside County, we're outpacing the national, but we're lagging behind the state. But if you look at coming out of the, in the pandemic and kind of that start of the post-pandemic area, we're seeing an accelerating rate of growth of entrepreneurs in the region that's outpacing national and state. If you look at the startup early survival rate, so how, how many of these startups actually survive over a period of time? Inland Empire outpaces both national and state pretty widely. So that's a good thing. The, the startups that are being created here are surviving 
um, relative to their peers on the national and state level. If you look up the look at the uh, job creation level from startups um, for us in the region, uh, up until the pandemic, we were outpacing in the region, outpacing both state and national. That's declined a little bit, uh, but we're still outpacing the state at this point. The one thing we can't into it from this, and this is something we're doing a deep dive on right now, is what kinds of jobs, what are the quality level of those jobs, because that's very important. And the last piece, and this is where a really important distinction lies, uh, we look at the what we call opportunity share of new entrepreneurs. We look at necessity entrepreneurship versus opportunity entrepreneurship, and opportunity op entrepreneurship is driven by people that are already employed that start new businesses. Um, and the opportunity share of entrepreneurship for the region is low compared to national and state, which means we've got a lot of people starting businesses because they need to start one because they don't have a job. And generally what we see with opportunity share um, is that those are more innovative problem focused businesses that have more growth and scalability. So um, next slide, please. We also did a quick look, a uh, comprehensive survey over 1400 local entrepreneurs responded to what they thought were the most pressing challenges, uh, all the things we asked them a ton of questions. Obviously, the biggest challenges were the coronavirus pandemic and finding people, good people. Uh, but if we looked at minority-owned businesses as a part of that subset, they had cash flow and access to capital as their biggest issues. Uh, when we asked them what they really want to do to get out of their business, it was to increase the business, grow it, get access to more resources, um, you know, less government restrictions, those kind of things. So the the insight that we gained from their their feedback through that that survey was fantastic. Gave us a lot of insight and in what we could do to better serve them as an entrepreneurial community. Um, and if you go to the last um, slide we looked at the ecosystem and I'm not going to talk about our regional perspectives, but the ecosystem, we just wanted to see how healthy are we? And we used a green, yellow, red um, setup to say, are we doing well in certain areas that support entrepreneurs? What we saw was that we have really strong colleges and universities. We have a lot of entrepreneurial support organizations and programs and some really strong civic programs supporting entrepreneurship. Where we were really lacking on the other end was there's not a lot of emphasis on entrepreneurship as a career pathway in the K through 12. There's not a lot of um, focus. The, there's no media covering entrepreneurship in the region. It's starting to emerge. And early stage funding, there's an incredible paucity of it. Now the pipeline's a little bit uh, different too. So, you know, we tried to take a comprehensive look that could give us ideas on how could we use this data to better serve and develop and promote entrepreneurship in the region. And we also do custom reports on this, this kind of stuff. So um, it's pretty cool the insights we're able to get, um, which guide our policies and guide our actions as a community, because we know entrepreneurship is critical to the development of the region and the creation of good jobs um, and new innovation. So uh, I saw the link in the, in the uh, chat and um, uh, it's also on the IE Rise start, uh, research portal as well, if you wanna take the, and I'm always happy to geek out on the data and talk to you guys about entrepreneurship. Thank you, Mike. We'll go ahead and move on now to our next presenter, um, Jenna Leconte Heinle um, from HARC. Jenna? Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for including me on this. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, a study we did with Riverside University Health Systems Public Health. Um, next slide, please. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about HARC in case you don't already know who we are. We're a small nonprofit uh, research and evaluation organization, and we're based in Palm Desert in Riverside County. And our expertise is in community-based research and evaluation related to health, excuse me, health, wellness, and quality of life. We were founded because, um, you know, our two county region is huge and there's great county data out there, but the Coachella Valley is a unique um, area within that. And people wanted to have data about the Coachella Valley and couldn't find it. And so HARC was, hired, was created to uh, do a survey every three years of the health of the Coachella Valley and give that data back to the community at no charge. So we still do that. We're doing that right now for our sixth um, triennial survey. But we also partner with other entities to conduct research and evaluation on a fee-for-service basis. So this is really fun. Um, we partner with a lot of fabulous organizations, including some who are on this call. 
Um, and this uh, presentation highlights one of those. We did a, a partnership with Public Health, and this was funded by funds from the CDC. And we did uh, paper surveys. They are a lot more accessible to people who don't have internet, which is uh, an issue <laughs> in our county. And we used a random sampling address based. So 40,000 people got a, um, uh, a survey from us. And we were lucky enough to get a final sample size of more than 9,000 people who participated. So it's a really strong, robust um, survey. And the, the survey focused on COVID-19 attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs. So there's a lot of valuable information in there. And I'm not going to talk a lot about it because I don't have a lot of time. But um, I do encourage you to read our monster of a report, which they've uh, linked in the chat. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight some of the things I find most interesting about it, although there's a lot. Uh, most of the people in our county, thankfully, are fully vaccinated for COVID. Um, however, 10%, so one in every 10 people was unvaccinated and had no plans to get vaccinated. So we asked them why. And um, the top two reasons were really, I'm worried about the side effects or the allergy concerns, and I wanna wait and see what reactions other people have. But I thought it was really interesting that COVID has become so politicized that nearly one third of the people who didn't get uh, vaccinated and had no plans to get vaccinated said that the reason why was that they didn't trust their government. We also added some questions in there about trust for local government, such as, um, public health <clears throat> and where they get their um, information, where they rely on for information. So it's really uh, a fascinating look into how our region deals with a pandemic situation and what we've lost in terms of things like um, uh, jobs, etc. So like I said, it's a beast of a report. It's on our website, but coming next month, we'll have an infographic version, uh, a profile of Coachella Valley uh, individually, a geographic comparison, and some racial ethnic uh, deep dives to look at health disparities. So I hope that you find it interesting. Check out our website. We have all sorts of other data as well. It's all um, free for you to use. And um, give me a call if you ever want to geek out and talk data, like Michael said. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jenna. We'll go ahead and move on to our next presenter, Angel Mendiola Ross um, from the Other and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. Angel? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Angel. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley studying housing, policing, and racial inequality. As someone who grew up in the IE, it's, it's a real honor to be here with you all today and hear more about all the work that's happening in the region. Today, I'm gonna to share a little bit about a report that I wrote for the Othering and Belonging Institute at Berkeley in 2020 on demographic changes and police spending in the region since 2000. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and actually you can advance one more time because this is a data summit. Um, I'll focus a bit more on the publicly available sources that I use for the analysis. Uh, the first main source of data is the American Community Survey from the U.S. Census, um, which I'm sure many folks are familiar with. It provides data on things like poverty, unemployment, rent for households, rent burden households, racial demographics, and then this data can be downloaded directly from the U.S. Census or from Social Explorer. And many of these indicators are also available um, for the entire region, disaggregated by race, on a data tool that I used to work on called the National Equity Atlas. The second major source of data is municipal finance data. So for those who work within city government, there are probably even easier ways to access this data, but to get information on police spending or spending on things like community and economic development for multiple cities across multiple years, I use the California State Controller's Office um, local government finance data website. They provide both municipal and county level data. And some of my other data sources include um, the US Department of housing and urban development and the FBI's uniform crime reporting statistics. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the key findings really fall into three major buckets, poverty, housing, and policing. Uh, first, I found that poverty has increased in the vast majority of cities in the IE since 2000. 
In 24 places, the poverty rate increased by more than five percentage points. And this increase in poverty is also strongly associated with an increase in the share of renters relative to homeowners. Uh, in 95 places, so this includes cities and unincorporated communities in the region, a majority of renters spend more than 30% of their income on housing, so they're considered rent burden. Uh, additional data from the anti-eviction mapping project and tenants together also found that San Bernardino and Riverside counties had the two highest eviction rates in the state. Uh, so it is clear that many IE residents, uh, particularly renters, were struggling to make ends meet even before the pandemic. Yet just a handful of cities in the region have have considered, let alone passed policies like rent control, just cause for eviction or tenant right to council laws that could help contribute to residential stability. Um, but one area where cities do continue to invest uh, is the police. So in 2018, IE cities were collectively spending more than one billion dollars annually on the police. Uh, the city of San Bernardino, for example, has devoted 31% of all of their expenditures or about $74.5 million to police in 2018. And this was more than 11 times what the city spent on housing and community development. Overall, the report is really just a call for cities to move you know, beyond law enforcement based strategies to deal with social problems and adopt data driven policies that address the root causes of those problems. So for me, you know, the goal of research and, and kind of data overall is to build a case um, for policymakers and also for the public to really invest in the people and the youth of the Inland Empire and to help chart a path towards a more just region. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and I look forward to connecting with, um, with anyone and everyone from the region. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Angel. We'll go ahead and move on to the next person, Jennifer King from Arts Connection. Jennifer? Great, thanks. Uh, thanks again for having me as well. Um, I'll hop right in because we uh, have a lot to say in three minutes. <laughs> um, so go ahead and start with the first slide. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to present um, the first regional look at the arts and cultural nonprofits in the Inland Empire. So this was a collaborative effort of Arts Connection, which is the Arts Council for San Bernardino County, uh, the Riverside Arts Council and Music Changing Lives. Um, we got together really at the beginning of the pandemic and we said, hey, there, we don't have a sense of what the arts and cultural organizations need um, in terms of support right now, especially because of the pandemic. So we started hosting monthly meetings, um, launched a survey, um, hosted three focus groups and dozens of interviews. Really, the, the point of this was to better understand what the or, uh, organizations needed right now, but we used it as an opportunity to better understand the field so we could craft strategies for increasing the capacity of the entire sector over the next five to 10 years. Um, so it's a pretty extensive report that goes beyond just, you know, a basic understanding of the organization's budgets. Um, as you can tell, they're not operating with a lot of money. 58% surveyed reported operating budgets of $50,000 or less. Um, and only 25% of them own their own spaces. So they're providing a lot of service. 80 to 90% of them provide their programming for free or at a reduced cost. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, what I noticed or what we noticed is in terms of needs, organizations, especially nonprofits, right? Always say, we need help with grant writing. We need help with development. Um, but that's not always, um, it's not always clear about how to do that directly, right? We think we have to lean on foundations or we have to lean on grants. So we started looking at well, what's available at least in terms of those two areas. Um, nonprofits often rely on foundations and grants. However, the funding landscape in this region isn't as robust as in neighboring counties. Um, we all know that individual giving in the IE is um, pretty low compared to the state, right? $25 per capita, as well as the state's 262 um, per capita. Um, in terms of foundation support for arts and culture though, so in 2018, Los Angeles County received $257 million in foundation support. In the IE, it was 5.4. Um, in terms of state grants, um, 
organizations aren't really applying. So in 2018, San Bernardino County, just by itself, only received 10 of those grants for a total of $126,000. So there's some underlying factors why we're operating with smaller budgets, right? But there's more that we can do. And so what this report really dives into next is what else is needed to bolster the field? And this is the part that I'm most excited about because there's so many opportunities here. So, you know, when we think about, you know, what's not working, um, it provides the opportunity to think about, well, how can we, right? How can we fix it? How can we use data to help that? Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we learned in this report that in the county, in both counties, that there aren't a lot of formal structures um, to support arts and culture. So in cities, in San Bernardino County, there's only 10 cities that have a commission, a department or a committee to support the organization around, uh, is there a public art program? Is there some sort of local granting feature? Is there a mural ordinance? Those kinds of things. Is there a public art program? Uh, Riverside County only has eight. Um, so that's an opportunity right there for um, for advocacy more as as a as a group. There's also a, a lack of uh, data around the economic impacts of the arts. Um, we have the Otis report on the creative economy, which is awesome. If you don't know about it, make sure to check that out. It talks about how creatives are employed across different industries. The IE alone, um, we boast thirty thousand creative industry workers by the job classifications used in that report. There's a lot of opportunities to grow in the field of uh, creative goods and digital media. Um, but how do we support the nonprofits? Um, we don't have enough data to do that. Um, so this report re revealed that as kind of an area for growth. Uh, so what we're starting to do actually this year is we are partnering with Riverside County um, and the Inland Empire Community Foundation to be a part of the Arts and Economic Prosperity Report, which is a national report with 394 communities across the United States um, that will provide us with the exact, with the data of what happens when you host an art event, how much does a person coming to that community spend in addition to the cost of coming to that event? Um, and then also what do the nonprofits contribute to revenue as uh, well as um, to supporting the local businesses? So that's something that we're really excited to be working on right now. Um, if anybody is interested in partnering to support that, we I would love that. Send me an email. I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, and then I'm not going to read through all of the recommendations that came through the report. There's actually pages and pages of them. Um, so I encourage you to read through the whole thing um, and hop on board. We're going to be starting some working groups. Um, we recently hosted a symposium uh, a couple weeks ago with Laura Zucker as our guest speaker. And we're gonna be starting a couple small working groups to build a regional policy platform um, where we can start to grow that infrastructure to support the nonprofits, to grow the creative industry workers. Um, sorry, that was a lot to do in, in three minutes. Hope um, if there's any questions, feel free to direct message me. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We'll go ahead and move on to our final report for the research showcase with Veronica Tariquez from the UCLA Chicano Studies Resource Center. Veronica? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to be presenting this report, Emerging pa Youth Power in the Inland Empire, co-authored with uh, students from the IE, including Angel Mendiola Ross, who's on this call, Olivia Rodriguez, Jasmine Miles, and Rocio Aguayo. So um, I study youth organizing, which is um, an approach to youth development in which young people engage in transforming policies and systems. Young people work to get out the boat and they work to change policies that affect their everyday lives. And in 2018 and 2019, we surveyed the youth organizing groups that we knew about in the region and um, interviewed some of their young leaders. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things um, to know about youth organizing, um, so I have a statewide perspective and I know that for, based on the survey data, the interview data we've gathered, there's some pretty, of mighty groups in the Inland Empire, um, but they often encounter a lot of resistance and opposition 
more so here in the IE than in other parts of the state. And that has to do with the history of racism in the community and, and anti-immigrant sentiment in some communities. So really young people face often face a hard time advocating for their rights. But nonetheless, they are trying to address different issues that matter to them, including immigration, criminal justice reform, uh, education justice. Um, eight out of the 12 groups that we surveyed worked on voting and getting out the vote. Um, health is another top issue. And so uh, young people have been at the forefront of campaigns and have had varying levels of success um, because give, they often face a lot of challenges to really mounting uh, large scale uh, campaigns. However, we do know that when young people are learning how to engage in politics, how to advocate for themselves and their communities, this has a lasting impact on their leadership development. So young people who become involved in these types of campaigns can continue to serve in leadership roles in their communities. And they also um, engage their family members and larger networks in trying to improve things um, to address the needs of sometimes the most marginalized members of their communities. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we look closely at in this report was, were voting patterns, um, voting registration and voter turnout patterns. And we have additional reports forthcoming on um, young people's efforts to get out the vote. Um, but I do want to share that um, in the Inland Empire, uh, voter registration and uh, voter turnout tends to be a bit lower than in other parts of the state. So for example, in the last midterm election, um, out of every 100 eligible voters in the IE age 18 to 24, only 57 were registered to vote and only 21 turned out. And this compares to um, much, uh, higher numbers for the state. So during the same election, out of 100 voters um, in the state, who were eligible ages 18 to 24, 67 turned out to vote. I mean, I'm sorry, 67% were registered and 32% turned out to vote. So um, there's a lot of work to be done to support youth organizing and voter engagement in the region, but there's a lot of possibilities um, because there's some really committed young leaders and organizations um, that are working with diverse uh, young people. So I'll leave it at that. You can look at our report. I'll put the link in the chat and I'm happy to talk more with those of you on the call either today or some other time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you to everyone that contributed for our research showcase portion of the program. We're quickly going to have a quick data demonstration from Mike McCarthy. He's going to share his screen. We're a little bit behind schedule, so it's just going to be um, a little bit shorter version of a data demonstration. We won't have time for Q&A, um, but Mike? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike McCarthy. Uh, I'm with Radical Research LLC. I'm the sole proprietor of that organization. And this work uh, is called Warehouse City. I hope you can all see my screen. Um, this is a collaboration with the Redford Conservancy at Pitzer College uh, and is an outgrowth of the LA Times article from May that uh, Professor Phillips and undergraduate student Graham Brady did showing the growth of warehouses in the Inland Empire. And so uh, I reached out to her afterwards because there are some warehouses being built in my neighborhood and I was like, I want her data. And so she gladly uh, provided that data. This is all publicly available data from uh, county assessor databases. And we built this tool to help visualize and quantify the logistics footprint in the Inland Empire. And so um, this is basically just a way of seeing how much uh, warehouses there are, where they are, and what their cumulative impact is. And so I'm going to go through this a little bit. Uh, right now. So first, uh, this is a live screen share. You can see the link here. I will post that in chat later on. Please don't jump on right now because I'm not sure that my license for Shiny apps can really handle 50 users at the same time. So please take your time. Uh, but basically, we can see uh, each of these brown squares is basically a warehouse. And if you mouse over each individual one, you can see when it was built, uh, the square footage, and the parcel number, and the type of classification it is in the, uh, in the database. And on this table, it says the cumulative number of warehouses, their acreage, their square footage, and that's 1.6 billion. 
the number of truck trips, which is over a million daily, and then some uh, air quality emissions factors. We also have these sliders, which allow us to choose to just look at more recent time periods if we want to see just the local uh, or the, the more recent impacts. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the selection radius uh, in a bit. We do have a few toggles that we're able to do. So we can, instead of using a roadmap, we can see a satellite image, which is useful for quality assurance. And then one thing I did want to show on the large scale is size bins. So this just color codes the parcels to see how big they are. And now the server disconnected. I'm sorry, you're getting a live demo. Uh, let's see if this reloads quickly. All right, if I have to go to my, I have a backup plan in case this is too slow. All right. Sorry, it's a little bit slow because there's lots of data in here. Um, do, 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 do. All right, so let's wait for a second here. So I'm going to click this again. The, the main point of showing the size bins is just to show um, that the larger warehouses are almost all exclusively being built in the Inland Empire, where darker colors are larger warehouse sizes, where dark is usually 500,000 500, or a million plus square feet um, of warehouse space. And so those are almost exclusively being built in the Inland Empire. And the reason for that is most of the Los Angeles County uh, warehouses were built uh, pre-70s and most of the Inland Empire ones have been built in the last 50 years. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit to Ontario, which is uh, the location of the Ontario Giga Cluster of Warehouses, as I like to call it. So we can see that there's lots of warehouses here, uh, but how many warehouses are there? And so that's uh, hopefully what my tool will be able to do quickly if I uh, click on this link and I'm getting uh, that there, uh, hopefully. Yeah. Hope not too many people are on the tool right now because it's probably why it's choking. Do, 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 do. All right, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait five more seconds and I'm gonna switch screens. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second, everybody. I'm gonna go to my backup plan, which is the local code. Hold on a second. All right. All right, so now I'm gonna go to this. This is just a local version, so I'm not uh, dealing with the uh, traffic of uh, the website. All right, so when you click on a spot on the map, it should theoretically draw a circle. And so what that does is it allows the user to select a circle that they live in and select the number of warehouses near them. So this table updates and the warehouse floor space updates and the truck trips updates. And so it just says within this circle, how many warehouses are there? How many truck trips are there? What's the emissions from those things? And you can choose a different size. So if you want to see the whole Ontario Giga cluster, you can go to 10 kilometers and then you can go into imagery and see, you know, okay, well, let's look at where people actually live. There's some houses here. So these folks right here are exposed to a thousand warehouses totaling, you know, with 250 million square feet within 10 kilometers of their house in this circle. And so we can quantify the impacts. And so the goal of this tool is it's a cumulative impact tool. What is the cumulative impact of all these warehouses? There are a number of limitations with this data set. And I did want to talk about those really quickly. Um, and I don't know why I'm, I don't, I don't really want to be admitting people, sorry. So first off, if we really zoom in um, to the very nearby level, you can see that all of these brown outlines are the parcels that we've identified in the assessor database as warehouses, but there are plenty of parcels, for example, here and here and here and here, which are, they look like warehouses from a satellite image, but I don't have them identified as warehouses in the data set. So those are misclassified and therefore we are likely undercounting those particular parcels in this data set. Uh, and the second thing is sometimes we classify parcels as uh, warehouses, which are probably something else. They are probably like, this is probably not a warehouse. It's some sort of light industrial thing. And so sometimes we're classifying things as warehouses that aren't warehouses. And sometimes we're not classifying warehouses as, as uh, and so there are some issues with the database. I did want to caveat that. We don't, we don't want this to be uh, thought of as a, a perfect tool. It is our first cut and we're trying to improve the database, but we don't have a perfect tool yet. Um, I did want to talk about a um, couple other things real quick. Um, we do have a readme file, which helps people to navigate the tool in case you want to see how it works. Uh, it 
documents where the data came from, our methods. There is a GitHub page. This data is all open source, publicly available. Uh, I haven't linked that here. If you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to give that to you. My email is at the bottom of the page. Um, and I did want to say one other thing, uh, just to show my own particular use case, because that's that's the one that I built this tool for, because I'm a little bit selfish, because I, I'm posing some warehouses near me. So I live over here. And so I was trying to understand and quantify how many warehouses are near me. And I wanted to know how many were built in the last, say, five years, right? And so I can choose this tool to show just the warehouses built in the last five years, what square footage there is just for that. So there's 70 warehouses built within 10 miles of my, or six miles of my house in the last five years. And I can say that to my local planning agencies and my local uh, uh, environmental justice group. Everybody can use this tool to see and be on the same page as to what is being built uh, in an area across jurisdictions without sort of sort of the city boundaries and county boundaries of who's, who's responsible for the individual parcels. And with that, I think that's the whole the whole thing I wanted to share today, one thing we do want, um, because there are data validation issues, we need community stakeholder groups and people with on the ground knowledge of individual parcels to help us improve this data set. If you can reach out and let us know if we're missing anything, we'd love to improve the data set. Or if you have any comments on the methodology, if we're doing anything wrong, I know that my emissions numbers are a little bit out of date. We're using MFAC 2007 as opposed to 2021. So we're gonna be updating those next week. So please do let us know if there's anything we can improve or make this more usable. We are hoping to have a YouTube video and a Spanish translation eventually, but we don't have those yet. So those are all in, in the, in the uh, pipeline. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you, everyone. So now what we're going to do is move into our breakout sessions. So for um, these will be other data demonstrations for other data tools. Um, so in breakout room one, we're going to have Ask Choose. Breakout room two, there's going to be the California Department of Education. Breakout room three is going to have Cal Enviro screen. And breakout room four is going to have Race Counts from the Advancement Project of California. So if you can go to the bottom of your screen um, and click which um, breakout session you'd like to join, please go ahead and do that now. Eric's gonna be opening up the rooms. If you have any questions, um, don't know how to get to the breakout room, Eric's going to be staying here in the main room to guide you all. And then um, breakout sessions will last 25 minutes. So we'll be back here in the main room at 11.25. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, and yeah, I, would, I didn't know going often um, uh, folks that, that build these things think about the power users that are working with raw data and micro data um, and uh, often you know, miss the larger picture in terms of a wider uh, user uh, community. And I would say this is probably a more data expert community than a broader set of um, actors, especially in the nonprofit sector um, in our region. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind when we uh, build um, a um, data hub um, together. So if you can stop the um, sharing on that, and then if you can do the slide share here. Great. So one of the things, uh, you know, one of the first questions, uh, you know, we need to ask as we try to build a data hub is what kind of user um, do we, um, you know, do we have in mind? And there's probably multiple types of users. So even as we're talking about a data hub, chances are we're talking about a hub that'll have different um, kind of doors you can go into depending on the kind of user you are. Uh, but we need to keep that in mind. Are we thinking about the general public? Are we thinking about journalists? Are we thinking about um, uh, you know, folks with uh, kind of an entry level consumer ex level of expertise or more moderate level of expertise? Are we thinking about decision makers of various stripes and what might be persuasive to decision makers in different types of institutions? Uh, what is the purpose of the data hub? Is it to inform? Is it to um, help persuade uh, the use cases, right? Um, is it to help uh, community-based organizations write better grant applications and to pull the kind of key indicators 
that they need, uh, either involving a particular community or involving a particular issue or involving a particular geographic area and getting them kind of easy and quick access to that information uh, so that they can you know, write stronger grant applications, do better uh, advocacy, do better uh, planning and the like. Um, there are also important principles that we need to think about in terms of data sharing principles, um, including you know, who is uh, responsible for uh, building the data hub, maintaining the data hub, maintenance of the timeliness of uh, the data contained therein, uh, who's responsible for the accuracy of information that is presented there if there are multiple contributors uh, to this collective resource. And then what does it look like in terms of uh, crediting and licensing uh, as it involves that? I'm not saying that we're gonna answer all of these questions, but these are some of the questions for those, and I assume that all the people that are sticking around uh, and now, and I, and I counted at least over 50, at least last. Yeah, so it's like, wow, okay. Well over 60 people still sticking around, thinking, you know, wanting to dig deeper into what kind of data hub should we think about uh, building together. And then finally, uh, for the kinds of uh, environments, so like what is the, uh, you know, um, infrastructure we should use? Uh, ArcGIS has an ArcGIS hub, um, you know, maybe stronger in some dimensions, such as maps and particular type of data dashboards, uh, but maybe not as strong when it comes to sortable data tables. Um, that's where something like Tableau might come in when you're talking about uh, control over the type of sheets uh, that are presented, uh, presenting sortable tables and even uh, charts that emerge out of those tables. It is proprietary and it, and it has its limitations. I have found as a user using mobile devices, it's not as mobile friendly where a lot of our uh, community-based organizations and community uh, and community members uh, operate. Then, you know, for more power users, you have uh, repositories like GitHub, uh, Dryad, and others that give you version control, a um, fair amount of transparency in terms of the updating of data sets. We can go with other types of more basic information sharing, such as Google Drive, Google Workspace, uh, and other, um, you know, uh, other um, environments where that could be shared. And then uh, there may be others that uh, people have in mind. And in fact, I would encourage you all if you, if there's some environments that you have found outside of the ones here, um, and I did mention Dryad, which is something I'd, I'll say it's new for me uh, in terms of a, uh, an environment where a lot of academics um, put their data into uh, data repositories. Um, but uh, feel free to type in the chat. And since this is being recorded, um, we would love to get your, uh, you know, collect all of this and bring it back to uh, a more intensive session in terms of folks who uh, want to be part of um, subsequent planning and design uh, conversations. But before I go on, uh, if, you know, I don't want to just be talking at all of you. So if anyone wants to unmute and add any uh, additional thoughts just on these uh, items here, um, please do so or raise your hand and happy to call on you. Okay, the next, um, and, and, and you know, we're, we're gonna uh, stop the screen share in a bit and just engage in conversation. Uh, next uh, involve kind of what are some of the core principles in terms of ethical and responsible um, uh, data and, and research. Uh, and this is something, again, I'll say, this is something that is brand new to me. Uh, and I wanna thank the data librarian at, at UC Riverside uh, Kat, I'm, I'm blanking on Kat's last name. I don't know if Kat is it, uh, here uh, oh, today. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, Koziar. Yeah, so Kat Koziar is, is here. Uh, so if you can go to the next um, next slide. Um, and Kat had suggested that we think about, and again, this is just to give people exposure to this. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Huh. I don't know why. Okay, you know what, folks, for some reason, let me see. On my side, I see a whole bunch of uh, core print, the, the care principles come up. So if you can stop the screen share, Eric, and then see, I don't know, maybe it didn't sync it on, on my end. Um, but um, in the meantime, actually, so Kat, since you're here, if you can talk about the care principles and the, huh, okay. You know what, I had it all up and for some reason it didn't sync. So I'll ask Kat if you can talk about the care principles, Kat, 
in terms of its background and some of the key uh, components of that. And, and uh, you know, as a data librarian and someone working in an institution, why you found that pretty resonant and important for us to think about. Uh, yes, the care principles were uh, established uh, for uh, indigenous data, basically, and the whole idea is that the data that the people is are about uh, the data, yeah, the data that represents the people that whatever community should belong to that community. And so they established this uh, list of principles called the care principles um, that um, actually speak to that. And so CARE is an acronym and uh, it stands the whole, it stands for collective benefit, uh, authority to control responsibility and ethics. And each of those, um, those letters also have other principles that support like what actions can you, can you have uh, take with your data in order to uh, make sure that the data that is about a community is for the collective benefit of that community, that they have the authority over it. And it was established in, in contrast to what uh, the and the, those of us in the, the academy um, and research know as the, the FAIR principles, and that's for open data, where you want to make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and reusable. And the whole idea is that, like, that's really fine for, say, like, the CO2 data, right? We want that as findable as possible. That's basically science, right? But whenever you have data that is about people, you need to treat it differently. And um, and I think that the, the, these care principles can be uh, not just for data. Like I've, I've been touting this very uh, strongly with my other um, librarians librarian colleagues that we should think about this like with our collections with everything that we do that uh, is representative of a community we need to think about how it impacts that community and make sure that they still have ownership of whatever this is because we can't go in and like we need to change that mindset of thinking we can just use all of these things we shouldn't right so great thank you Kat and in fact so uh, I think I don't know, folks. I don't know if I'm seeing warnings on my screen saying editing is taking longer than anticipated. So I don't know, uh, Sarah and Eric, do you see the, the the care principles slide that I added, or do you not see it on your screen? Okay. So there is a a, a, a website link for the Global Indigenous uh, Data Alliance, um, and that's uh, and so that's something that uh, if someone can drop it in the chat in terms of these principles. So that is something uh, you know I think we should all keep in mind and. We might not be able to hit all of these principles, but Kat, I, I, I really value you um, flagging that as well as other kinds of open data principles, right? So it's like simultaneous thinking about what, again, this doesn't obviate the prior set of things uh, that I mentioned in terms of, you know, what, who's the user, what is the intended use? Um, what are ways that, you know, we can make sure that the data is, so the FAIR principles are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and then the, you know, the care principles layer um, on top of that. Um, I think someone had their hand raised. So I wanna um, see if, uh, whoever that was uh, that wants to say something. Uh, is it, was it Wendy um, who had your hand raised? Yeah, I, first of all, I just so appreciate the summit. It's just incredible and it's such a, great value and asset to kind of the collective impact that we're trying to do in the Inland Empire, right? So thank you so much to all the presenters. Um, my question is, um, in terms of working with county, um, you know, government officials and things like that, in terms of um, data collaboration, how, how are you guys doing that? And um, so that's kind of really a general question in terms of the governmental level in the local counties. Yeah, so that's one of the things. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can get to that. Um, you know, I do have a couple of other slides. I think they'll show up, uh, but if not, then let's jump to that. But if we can just go to the next slide in terms of examples um, that we have, um, you know, and I, so let's put that slide up in terms of different types of examples. But the two things I wanna lift up in the public sector, I think the LA County Open Data Portal is quite amazing and pretty impressive. If there is a way we can figure out 
either just Riverside County or just San Bernardino County, or figure out a way between the two counties and either just UCR or our higher ed institutions, but essentially to, uh, to kind of build a, a consortium uh, that can host data. Now, one of the things when you talk about county governments is most of the data they can put on there is, is data either at their level or at other kind of like trusted sources from their perspective, say state agencies or federal agencies. But in terms of private data collections, I think they're probably, there's probably a set of bureaucracy involved, right? If there's a private data collection, including those coming from academic institutions to be able to put it up in a, in a repository. So maybe there is a different kind of model uh, we can have. Now, in addition to the kind of open uh, data repositories like what LA County has, or what SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments. Uh, earlier, I saw a couple of folks from SCAG uh, on the call, including Gigi Morena, who's shared generously a bunch of resources uh, in terms of uh, data repositories and data tools uh, to consider. Going beyond that, and I do think, uh, if you can go to the next slide or the one after that. Yeah, okay, this one. So alternatively, not maybe not alternatively, so there's, the, the kind of open data portals, there's a fair amount of user friendliness, but I would say it still requires a certain kind of power user to be able to understand these resources. And essentially, depending on the door you go behind, the data is presented in different ways. Sometimes it's just presented as raw tables that are like Excel spreadsheets or you know CSV files that you download. Sometimes they have some kind of graphical user interface, simple graphical user interface. Something that's much more highly produced is what uh, PolicyLink has done in the Bay Area with the Bay Area Equity Atlas. I would encourage you, if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, to see what they've built. Now, this is not cheap. Uh, this is, and this is something that has taken many years to iterate on and build. Uh, but they have different ways of uh, choosing indicators as well as uh, geographies and, and being able to examine uh, equity uh, in different ways relying heavily on data, such as from the American Community Survey, but also using other types of data, right? Pulling data from various sources, but to um, answer a particular set of questions in a geographic area, such as the nine, nine county um, Bay Area. So I'll stop this, let's stop the screen share there. Um, but, um, you know, to the point about what kind of, uh, Wendy, what kind of, uh, Partnerships do we have? I mean, I, I, let's talk first about what already exists. So maybe there are um, Riverside County and uh, San Bernardino County, uh, you know, uh, data portals uh, that we already can look at and build on. From what I have seen, it's 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 more of a patchwork. Um, uh, what we have in our in our two counties compared to what uh, LA County has, but even beyond that, I mean, even if we think of LA County. Uh, from a government data perspective as you know, a high bar that we should uh, uh, emulate and try to clear. And especially if we have you know, infrastructure investments and uh, uh, you know, American Rescue Plan investments that can be used you know, to improve planning, especially uh, more community inclusion and greater community equity uh, in, terms of the, in terms of planning decisions and processes. Uh, but then also then going beyond that, are there things we can do differently you know, in addition to better county dashboards, um, can we think about a public-private partnership, you know, that potentially involves government, community organizations, academia, and philanthropy uh, to build something, again, thinking about the purpose in mind uh, to, you know, increase investments in our region, improve decision-making and planning, and really democratize this work as much as possible. Um, so that we have a lot more people who are at least aware of both the challenges and opportunities in this region. So I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, Wendy, I don't know if you have some thoughts, but then I would love to open it up to um, others as well. Oh, and then I see Stephanie. Yeah, I, ahead, I just Wendy. want to comment. Thank you for that, for that response, because it just makes me think about trying to be well-coordinated and, and better coordinated of our time. Um, and I'm just thinking in terms of what the state is trying to do to kind of have a shared data with all the populations and population health. And so it's just, you know, it's a great vision to kind of, instead of duplicating efforts to really collaborate in what are, what are we doing as it is. So um, yeah, thank you. 
Great, thank you, Wendy. Next, I see Stephanie. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, but yes, uh, again, I want to iterate, uh, you know, thanks for um, providing this data summit because I have really been waiting for a way to collaborate in terms of data. Uh, so my main question is, I've seen so far a lot of the data has a mix of primary and, and secondary data sources. And I think one of the biggest issues with the Inland Empire, for example, is the lack of granularity in terms of data and more of us. Oh, yeah, I got nods. Excellent. Uh, in more of a city, zip code, kind of census tract regional level. So, for example, a majority of our main data sources is like, for example, the American Community Survey. I think that's a lot of of what we use. So I have, for example, my organization, Inland SoCal United Way, I think hopefully most of us know that we run a 211 call center and it covers the majority of the Inland Empire. And we would actually consider ourselves as a primary data source. Um, and so my job is to kind of be able to make that data available to other organizations. So I would like to know how you, how if we were to create this data hub, what it would take for maybe nonprofit organizations like ourselves to be able to contribute our primary data to the benefit of everyone else. Thank you, Stephanie. So I think this is where, so for, so by the way, so maybe there's some additional questions we should be um, throwing on the table. And then what I would say is if there are folks that, uh, you know, we will have a post survey where people can uh, check off, you know, if their interest in continuing to be part of a small working group on the, on the data hub. But even prior to that, if folks just now want to drop their emails in the chat, again, this is being recorded and captured and we can figure out, you know, who, who, who those volunteers will be in terms of uh, building, building that, um, that you know that 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 initial uh, set of design considerations. And I've also dropped my email in the chat in case people just want to contact me directly rather than sharing email out with everyone. So please okay. email me as well. Great, uh, thank you, Sarah. So I mean, so some of the principles, for example, Stephanie, like um, in terms of the responsibility for maintenance, knowing knowing the vintage of the data, right? And if it's just a an API poll into you know, a server right, or, or a map layer that is synchronized with what you're doing, being able to document that and make it transparent for anyone using it, right? So they know how current the data is, if it's a primary data source that is a, you know, that is somehow being refreshed or, or periodically um, refreshed. Um, then there's also crediting and, and licensing issues. So I think, I mean, I think most people would agree that if someone contributes their primary data to um, to a collective that you know they should be properly credited. So how do we make sure that if someone is using um, you know different types of data, either in terms of data that's presented on a map or um, tabular data or whatever else, uh, you know, make sure that we make it easy for the end user to be able to credit the primary source, um, or if it's someone who's like taken primary data and created something else and put it as part of the repository or a hub to be able to, um, to credit them. But I uh, would love others' thoughts as well. It sounds like there's a fair number of folks who see the value in doing this. But one of the first questions I would wanna ask is that, should we, oh, so actually there is a, there's a second polling question. So actually, if you can bring that second polling question, Sarah, and then, um, and hopefully we can make that, uh, you know, that, that poll could hopefully help uh, us figure out what we should uh, maybe prioritize, right? In terms of um, what should get our, at least our initial attention. So the poll question is up. And the question is in building out a data hub, what should be the highest priority in the beginning and select up to two options. By the way, the, the data repository of tables and microdata is you know, more akin to what we see with LA County and their open data. Better interactive charts, including trend and key priorities, that's looking more like the Bay Area Equity Atlas. Better dashboards for general public across indicators. You know, with COVID-19, you had um, you had both counties, right, that 
that built up some pretty uh, user-friendly um, dashboards that um, you know had uh, chart data as well as maps uh, and, and trend data as well. And then finally, the consolidating of map layers across indicators. This is something that we found our center when we're working with both counties on planning for census outreach, that you know, each of these counties have data across departments. And even if some of that integration is happening for county employees and agencies themselves, uh, it's not necessarily um, built you know, uh, and shared with the larger public. So you know, potentially leveraging um, you know, some of the work that's already happening with them. Um, so go ahead and let's end that poll. Sarah, and then we can share it. And then I see um, Deborah Ferris, who I'll call on, and then Marcelina. Go ahead, Deborah. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, I um, thank you for calling on me. I just an idea as I'm as I'm thinking about this this data hub. One of the most um, kind of effective aspects of organizing people using data is in that I've seen work with. Um, collective impact projects is the ability of communities to kind of come together and identify which data points they want to use as indicators and kind of create their own dashboard. And I don't know if this would be technologically possible, but I would imagine that a data hub would be really effective if, it, if there were some way for groups, organizing groups, to customize their own dashboard um, through the hub. I mean, obviously you could go get the data from the hub and plug it into your own space. But a lot of grassroots groups don't have the, 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 the capacity, the you know, technology capacity to do that or to host that themselves. So being able to host something, a customizable dashboard on the data hub, mm -hmm. I think would be really- so, so maybe then choose the kind of indicators that you're interested in and maybe the geographies that you're interested in. And, and Stephanie, to your point, I mean, even sometimes with ACS data, there are ways to start getting you know, sub-county geographies, but not necessarily by municipality um, within the region. But uh, so you're suggesting it's like an early selector in which maybe then even just preserve those choices. Yeah. Deborah, that, that, that way then when they, so maybe then create a user account where it kind of remembers what your priorities are and then it just refreshes it if there's new data that comes yeah. in. And that, that could be publicly linked to, right? So you could throw it up on your own website and it would link to the data hub for the dashboard that you and your organizing group or your organization has has identified for whatever okay. project you're working on. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, next, I'll go to Marcelino. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking about this, what you're mentioning oh, about- Oh, and also, by, and by the way, can folks, I mean, people may know everyone else just, Say who you are and uh, you know what kind of work you do or organization you're part of. And Deborah, I should have asked you the same. So, but go ahead, Marcelina. Yeah, I was just going to say that with the ideas that you're developing, I think definitely having the um, like the micro data or the main primary sources along with the user interactive data. It's kind of like what you already see already for the GSS and also U.S. Census. U.S. Census has recently updated their, like in the last year or so, updated their platform. So you can actually create your own charts and everything. Um, so I think anything along those lines where the user has access to primary sources and can actually interact and create their own sources and even their own maps, I think would be you know, a great idea for the, for the area, for the region. Thank you, Marcelino. Okay, I have... Uh a tween and a teenager at home, so you might hear some screaming in the background. School is out. Um, other thoughts in terms of design principles, considerations, priorities in terms of uh, user community. Um, I would love to hear, yeah, I, I see some other folks uh, from county agencies here. Uh, would love to hear thoughts about, or maybe even there are things already underway that are not just, not yet, ready for kind of public consumption or even data resources that people should be aware of. Because a lot of times when it comes to data tools, these tools exist. There's not as much um, public or stakeholder awareness of um, data tools that might already exist. So I don't know if anyone wants to speak to some of that. And that's certainly one of the things we're hoping to do in this work is to, before we start building new things, um, making people aware and getting them to use existing tools as well. And certainly what we had with our demonstration today, 
with various, uh, you know, regional, statewide, and even some local ones was part of that. But I don't know if anyone wants to say more about that. Maybe I can say something to that Go personal ahead. experience. So I think uh, in my experience as a data analyst, as someone who shares data with people that are interested in it, I think it really comes down to the idea of data itself, because a lot of people tend to have a misnomer or misconception about data. For example, if someone were to go on a dashboard or something, it might to a lot of people I've realized seem very kind of overwhelming in the sense that also, you know, to kind of to talk about Deborah's point to be able to figure out which metrics are you know going to be the ones of most interest and I think on our end there might have to be an education piece attached to the ability to have a data hub to kind of help organizations such as for example nonprofit organizations realize the strength of data and what the benefits are in terms of becoming more data driven because I think everyone here knows that Everyone, probably most organizations are really good at collecting data, but when it comes to utilizing that data or kind of bringing the trends out of that, they are mm, kind of lost in that sense. So in that, in that saying that, I'm sure that, for example, a lot of people are sitting on a wealth and treasure trove of data, but they don't know how to utilize it. So I think, you know, having us like this kind of coalition together that can also provide educational pieces, in addition to also building out the resources that people can access, can help our, you know, region be more data driven. I hope that. Yeah, no. that. That sounds great. So maybe then beyond just the hub, I mean, then this is something, for example, when we see with Advancement Project California, right, with their race counts, not only do they build it, they make sure that it's useful to community. And there's this two-way street, right, in terms of uh, not just communication, but, uh, but planning and design and redesign. Uh, so I think each organization uh, can and uh, should certainly do that. Potentially, what we could do is to create a space, say, once a month, we leave it open for someone who's created um, a data tool or repository that is open to the public to not only do a training on it, but have that kind of community feedback process. Um, and by doing that, you know, make it regular and give different folks uh, an opportunity. David, I see your hand up. Yeah, hi, Karthik. Thank you for organizing this very interesting meeting. And it's uh, really a pleasure to see all different sorts of organizations represented um, I wanted to, to give my two cents on it. I think that uh, it's really important to have in, in conjunction with this data, you know, technology driven approach that we need to figure out what are the right questions that we want to have answered and how do we combine the power of all of these independent databases with public data in order to address those questions. And just one, one thing I'm thinking about is that I think we all agree we've not been terribly effective at competing with other regions for funding. And so perhaps there are issues around um, how do we get uh, better access or win more state and federal grants for economic development and community development and use our data as a way of competing against others by, by using it more smartly. So uh, once again, thanks for the for the forum today. Um, look forward to continuing to be part of it. Great, thank you, David. And I would say, yeah, one hundred percent. And you know, sometimes this is where, at least with our framework of data, narrative, and action, it's also what are the kind of narratives that have taken hold, and what kind of ways can we present the data? Often that's through visualization to correct people's kind of impressions or stereotypes or outdated notions about who we are. And often that's true even people within the region. It's not even necessarily perceptions from the outside, it's even perceptions from within. Uh, and that's gonna be critical uh, to think about how we um, change those mindsets, you know, with the kind of, but to your point, what are the questions we're trying to answer and how can we use data strategically uh, to grow investments, improve sustainability, improve equity uh, in our region? Uh, Melissa, over to you. One second, Karthik, oh. I know we're at time. So I just want to remind everyone to please fill out the event survey. The link is in the chat, um, but in, we can continue the conversation a little bit more, but I know some folks have to jump. So I just wanted to make that announcement really quick that the link is in the chat for the event survey. 
Great. Thank you, Sarah. And let's make Melissa's uh, comment slash question the last one, and then I'll kick it back to you, Sarah, to close it. Um, thank you guys for hosting this um, data summit. I've learned in the past when I worked in Virginia that data was the key to turning around underperforming schools and teaching teachers how to use that data to get to the root of the problem actually does um, improve things within less than a year. So there's actual data with results and uh, to prove those notions. But when we're looking at a data hub here in the IE, I guess um, I value the work that you're doing. And I feel as an organizer in Ontario, uh, especially for the Latino community, a lot of our community always says, I don't need to vote. I don't need to be involved because nothing affects me. So how are we going to use that data and how are we going to use it to outreach to our community um, in order to get our community to understand the issues um, at hand and want to participate in um, you know, those decisions or want to participate civically? Thank you, uh, Melissa. This is a big question and I would say, uh, I mean, for folks that are interested, uh, you know, you're here for the data but you're ultimately probably here for impact in various ways. Um, that's certainly why we're doing this. I mean, the, the reason why so many partners across the region got involved in the census was not only to reduce the undercount, which is so important in terms of driving resources to our region, but to really make sure that planning processes are much more inclusive uh, than they have been. And usually, you know, there's a, without any kind of ill intent, when you have what you know, scholars call informational asymmetry, some people have a lot more information skill than others. It's, it's a very uneven playing field, um, right? And then you layer on top of that, the kind of social relationships we all have and the gaps in our social relationships. Pretty easily you can see that communities that have traditionally not been welcomed or included or empowered, we un, you know, perpetuate this dynamic where it's just certain set of people with the social capital or expertise that uh, continue to be uh, you know, in conversations about deciding on long-term futures for our region. This is where I'm hoping not only with this data hub and data community, but also this 2030 vision and roadmap that we democratize this work a lot more. Uh, and you're right, Melissa, I mean, we need to be able to show people that it's not only by voting, but even getting more data savvy that things are actually gonna change. But we can't wait around for one or the other, at least in my view, you gotta do all this stuff simultaneously and hopefully we build a virtuous cycle as opposed to the vicious cycle that uh, unfortunately has happened for uh, far too long uh, in our region. And I'm just so thrilled to see folks from so many different sectors here uh, that are committed to improving the use of data for better inclusive, sustainable, and equitable planning. So with that, I'll kick it over to you, Sarah, and uh, we will follow up with all that want to be on this journey with us. Yes, thank you, Karthik. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to all of you that contribute to this conversation, and thank you all for attending too. Please remember to fill out that event survey so that we can get your feedback on how to build this data hub, how to do more events like this. Um, my email is in the chat. It's up there on the screen, as well as Damien's email. If you'd like to find out more information about the data hub, about IE Rise, or about our 2030 vision roadmap work that we're also about to be embarking on. So please stay in touch um, and we'll be following up soon with more information, more links, the videos and everything else. So thank you all for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.